Hello, and welcome back to another episode of This Healthy Life. I'm very excited to have my guest today, Dr. Amy Ofit. And Amy, Dr. Amy Ofit is the president of iLabs, and she's also the medical director and co-founder of Alt Integrative and Yoga in Marble Falls, Texas. She transitioned from rural family medicine to treating chronic inflammatory diseases with integrative medicine. She co-founded Heart and Soul with her husband, Brad, in 2007, and I'm so excited for her to be here today to share so much wisdom of what she did. Hi, lads. So much work that's going to be around helping people get proper treatment for Lyme disease, learn about your practice as well. So, Dr. Ofit, thank you so much for joining and welcome. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'd love to start by sharing a little bit about you and yourself and tell us a little bit about your own personal practice and what sorts of conditions you treat. Treat but into that. Okay. Um, I actually originally trained in family medicine with an intent to practice in a rural uh, family medicine setting. I did that for about seven years and I loved it. But about five years in, I started noticing that there was a trend uh, amongst the patients I was seeing where a lot of them were middle aged and weren't they just weren't feeling very good. Um, a lot of them were taking a few prescription medicines and I just felt like something was missing in the in the care that I was offering them. <clears throat> and I, even when I would ask older doctors, like, what would you do with this patient? A lot of them would say, um, maybe she would benefit from like an antidepressant. Like, sadly, like that was sort of, if nothing else was working, that's sort of where uh, people would go sometimes. And a lot of them really were just middle-aged and probably actually having some inflammatory and some hormonal issues that I did not know how to address, like in the conventional model that I trained in. Um, so I went back to school. I did a master's in integrative medicine. At first I did a functional medicine fellowship that was really eye opening. And I just kept learning and learning that there are other ways to address health issues that I honestly hadn't been initially taught. So in the process of going to school, it was actually during my integrative medicine master's. Um, one of the professors one Sunday, I remember this, it was in Washington, D.C. He said, today you're in for a treat. I'm going to treat you. I'm going to teach you about Lyme disease. And I remember even thinking, oh, no, we, like, what? <laughs> we don't have that in Texas, yeah. you know, and because um, that's what I was taught. And anyway, he quickly went on to say, you know, do all of you or any of you have patients who are challenging uh, to treat? You know, yes, all of us. Do any of you have patients with just chronic refractory inflammatory issues, headaches, joint pain that seems a little worse than just some arthritis or um, or maybe people that don't respond in the usual manner. Well, of course, we all have those patients. So he kind of mm. drew us in uh, to be curious with those kinds of um, leading words. And so he shared with us that day um, how he would evaluate and, and treat a patient uh, and I wrote down a list of patients that day that I came back and handed a list to my nurse. And I said, please call these patients and come, have them come do these labs. And all of them had the pattern he had described. So I, I, uh, the, the problem was at the time is I only had his protocol, which didn't work for every patient. So that's what prompted me to seek out more training, um, more other ways to treat, uh, you know, grow a larger um, acumen of, of therapeutic options. And so that's what led me to find ILADS and ILADS was so eye opening and just taught me so much, um, good practical clinical information about how to help people who really endure chronic suffering. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, I was so grateful to them to, you know, fast forward of going to the conferences a few years, I mm -hmm. was talking to someone about how we could, grow and collaborate. And then the next thing, you know, he nominated me to be on the board and I got on the board. And then the next thing, you know, someone said, you should, you should be the president. And so it just sort of sucked me in and here I am and, and I'm grateful for it. It's been such a good experience. There's so many wonderful people in the organization and um, what we all share in common, we all bring different perspectives, but what we all share in common is we all want to help these long suffering patients um, get better. So I've really enjoyed being a part of it. That's amazing. That's amazing that you cross paths with this doctor that, you know, eating Lyme and 
kind of opened your eyes into this whole world of all these people that are sublime every single day. And like you said, so many of them have no idea what's wrong or they're on a long list of stuff and pharmaceuticals for depression and joint pain and all these different things when no one's really getting at what the, what the root cause, which is this chronic disease that's affecting thousands and thousands of people. So I think that you got into it that way. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit about what ILADS is. I know there's going to be a lot of lists that are already familiar with ILADS and the great work that you guys are doing, but there's also going to be some that have, have no idea what ILADS is and what it's all about. So I'd love for you to share a little bit of information about that as, that as well. Of course. So ILADS is a nonprofit medical society that was founded 25 years ago. In fact, this year is the 25th anniversary of the organization. Uh, it's a, a group that's primarily dedicated to education. So we're, we exist in order to educate uh, primarily medical professionals in the evaluation and treatment of really chronic complex inflammatory illnesses. I would say originally it was formed because a small group of very um, discerning and caring physicians and researchers saw that when patients got Lyme disease, that there was a subset of them that didn't get fully better with the way that they were being treated at the time. And they felt like they needed to explore that further. It wasn't that initially that it wasn't necessarily controversial. I mean, actually it probably was, I was not in the organization at that time. Um, I'm, I was probably just finishing residency around that time. But um, but the doctors just wanted to to look into it more uh, thoroughly, try to figure it out. Uh, they had here and there treated their own patients with a longer extended course of antibiotics and found that it helped some of them. Um, so they really just kind of collaborated together and created the organization to study it more, to try to help each other, support each other, encourage each other in, in treating patients in a different way or maybe more thoroughly for a longer time period. Um, and it just grew from that point to be, now we have um, about a little over 500 or, you know, if you count all of our sort of ancillary participants, we have a lot of um, exhibitors and people that are very encouraging and supportive of us. We have a close to 600 members and, um, we meet for educational offerings. We have webinars. We had our 12th annual European scientific meeting in Germany um, this spring. That was well attended. That was very a very good meeting. We had our um, 24th annual scientific meeting in Boston last fall. This fall, it'll be in San Antonio. And it's just a really nice time to hear updates from people who are doing research, who are applying research concepts clinically. And then um, I always find some new information to take away from every meeting. And then there's also a lot of, it's interesting at the meetings, there will be people there. It's their first time they've never, you know, studied this topic. And there will be people that have been coming for years, you know, year after year um, and continuing to learn. So we try to serve everyone that comes with some new takeaway uh, educational information. And that's really, you know, ILADS is not really a patient advocacy organization. There are so many wonderful patient advocacy organizations out there. And we do like, you know, collaborative, uh, collaborative work with those organizations, but we're really dedicated and focused on educating more providers, more clinicians to catch this earlier, treat it better, help patients have better outcomes, better, you know, really better care. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that the other way that patients are getting cared for is necessarily intentionally inadequate, but so many patients have gone to so many different places, different doctors, different specialists, and they get a lot of prescribing done. That's like you mentioned earlier, it's more like, what symptom do you have? Okay, here's a prescription for that symptom. And we've kind of lost our curiosity in medicine of like what's going on underneath that we could potentially address and maybe maybe um, the patient wouldn't have to take a really expensive biologic or, you know, a collection of a lot of meds that may have some side effects or or negative effects, you know? Yeah. And at, at that point, you don't even know if you're suffering from 
whatever medical condition you went in first, or if it's a side effect of the five medications you're taking and it's in this web of like, oh, it's just, you know, I'm getting old or it's just a side effect of these taking now to help this one thing that still isn't even doing better. So yeah, so it's, I agree, you know, I definitely think doctors kind of are just quick to prescribe things and kind of know and not really think outside of the box um, so much, especially with some of these chronic, some of these chronic conditions. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, you know, there's kind of the two doctors can use generally for treating Lyme if you're kind of staying in the more like westerly. So you have ILADS, which, you know, like you said, is educating doctors and helping diagnose treatment plans. And then there's the IDSA um, and the CDC that say, oh, you can treat Lyme, you know, a 10 day course of doxycycline or whatever they're recommending these days. It really doesn't usually help people. So why is there such a divide? Why is there not Moses on what a proper treatment is for Lyme? And why is there so much controversy for chronic Lyme disease when there's been studies and tests that show that Lyme does persist? And it is, in fact, and a short course of antibiotics is not enough to treat it in most cases. That's such a big question to unpack. I know. It is a big um, one. <laughs> so... It's so I, I think that it is such a big shift uh, to think that a, a chronic infection could cause a chronic inflammatory condition from what most of us have been taught, that it's just, it's very challenging for, it was challenging for me when I first heard this other approach to even grasp what he was talking about, because that's not what I learned. Um, but I think all of us who are physicians, like it's really our job to keep learning and looking for, for root causes. If we, our curiosity has to stay high. It's, it's challenging when the, we've kind of let a lot of outside pressures take over the doctor patient relationship. We have, I mean, that's why I work for myself. I used to work in a corporate medical environment and I, for the first five years, I felt okay with it. And then it started, some new administration came in and it was, I couldn't see enough patients to, you know, satisfy their, their expectations. And I just, I felt like I was working so hard and, um, and just never could quite meet their, what they were looking for with regard to my numbers. Um, I was averaging around 25 patients a day and was exhausted and they wanted me to see more patients. And I was just like, how do you do that? I even asked one of the other doctors who had high numbers, how do you, how do you do it? And he said, Amy, I just don't put as much into it as you. And I was kind of like sad by that. And I, I do think there are some patients out there that's, they're, they're actually fine with it. I mean, integrative medicine is, is the patients do have to make changes. They have to look at their nutrition. They have to hydrate. They have to move. They have to look at their self-care and really be willing to make some changes for better habits, which that's one of the foundational things in treating patients with, you know, vector borne diseases is if they're not doing those things and say they were just taking antibiotics, they're, they're not, it's not going to get them where they want to go most of the time. So it's, it doesn't fit the quick appointment, you know, to, um, to go there with most patients. And the quick appointment is really kind of the modern delivery you know, avenue for healthcare. So I think, um, I don't think it's one particular person or entity that, that created this problem. I think it's so many different external influences. Some of it is just driven by marketing. Some of it's driven by administrative, you know, regulatory um, requirements. Some of it is like the business of medicine has really innovated the doctor patient relationship where, I mean, really the only thing that most doctors can do if they only have 15 or 20 minutes with a patient is write a couple of prescriptions. It's hard to say what happened, where were you, you know, how long have you had this, especially when someone's been ill for a long time and has already tried a lot of things, it just doesn't fit. So I think some people hang on to the other way because it's simpler. It keeps them from having to, you know, learn as much or think as hard, uh, take the time and really consider it. And I honestly just didn't know. Like before I learned, I really just had an ignorance toward it. So um, 
I didn't want to. I just I had no idea that that it was possible. And so it took another doctor sharing. Really, he introduced me by um, by telling me that these patients with chronic inflammatory processes could have a root cause. I'd never really entertained that idea in the past. I was taught in medical school and residency that autoimmune diseases may have a precedent infection, like maybe the patient had an infection before they got lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, but no one ever said, what if that pathogen hangs around and it's still there? And um, and that was controversial for a long time. It, it, it wasn't necessarily easy, easy to prove, um, but I think enough uh, information has been published now that it it does uh, persist. It is a persistent infection in so many patients. Um, and a lot of them don't even know they were ever tick bitten or flea bitten or that a cat scratch gave them an introductory dose of a pathogen, you know, not Lyme, but you know, a lot of, yeah, like there's a lot of other things going on. And if we really took a hard look at all of the numbers, the rise in autoimmunity and the rise in just chronic inflammatory symptoms, we should be really looking for root causes right now. Um, so that's kind of what ILADS, that is what ILADS is doing is <clears throat> trying to teach people to look for root causes and how to better address those. Um, and I think a lot of integrative medicine organizations are, are leaning that way too. Um, it's just a lot to, it's a really a lot to learn. I think that's part of the barrier. It's like, you can't just go to one conference and then go back to your office. And like, I tried to do that and it didn't work. You know, actually it was one of many conferences and I still felt like I didn't have all the tools and all the knowledge to be able to apply it. So it's a process. And um, so like in ILADS, we have a physician training program where we have someone spend time with us. Um, some of the people that have done it with me have spent a week with me <clears throat> in the office shadowing me with patients. And then afterwards, I stay available to them for questions or, you know, do we do follow up cases. We try to um, really support people who want to figure this out to learn more. I mean, that's the only way we're going to provide more care for more people is mm -hmm. to grow our network. Absolutely. And educate doctors that are going to be there in the field with their patients and being able to be more hands on a day with the people that they need to help. So, yeah, I agree. I think that's a great step. So let's talk a little bit about testing, which is also a very controversial subject with Lyme. You know, most people, if they go to the regular doctor and they're lucky to get a Lyme test or really only get LabCorp or Quest, the ELISA test, which is typically going to miss about 50% of cases. What sort of testing does ILADS recommend or train your doctors to patients? And which ones are you finding to be the more reliable ones until we have a truly reliable test? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, so <clears throat> ILAS tries to teach a lot on testing because really immunology is a, uh, needs to be understood fairly well to understand what kinds of tests are out there. I will just say that every single kind of currently existing text, uh, testing has pros and cons. Um, so there, there is available now um, direct testing through a research lab that's looking for the pathogen itself. And I like that testing. It's just they're only able to test for a few organisms. Um, they're kind of expanding that um, and it's expensive. So it's hard for patients who, you know, especially if they're really ill and they're not able to work or they don't have, you know, a lot of support. It's hard for them to afford some of the testing. Um, you know, Igenix has been around forever. They're a great company. They have great tests. Um, and it, it is controversial even amongst ILADS members. Like there are some test um, panels that aren't as expensive that, you know, there are internal arguments of like, are these tests valid or invalid? Um, to me, the missing piece of all of it is that it's really a clinical diagnosis. Like we have to have a very high clinical suspicion. And then the lab testing is there to kind of back us up or target in a little bit better on what the patient was exposed to. But we know that these chronic infections, they evade immune responses. So 
if someone's really, really ill, they may not have an antibodies showing up on Igenix or if you do Vibrant or if you do, you know, any of the other uh, smaller specialty labs out there, they're certainly probably not going to have it on a regular Quest or um, CPL or LabCorp type um, Western blot or ELISA test. So when patients come and they have those tests positive, like I really believe them, but what's really what's really missing on those tests is they they just don't test for quite as many bands, so it's a little harder to have a positive. And I think those tests, you know, they're just they're just not as helpful. And I unfortunately see this happen a lot, where a patient may even see their primary. Maybe they have a really good story for having been exposed to one of these diseases. Maybe they even get referred to an infectious disease. And the test is done and they get told, you're fine, your test is negative, but they still have all the symptoms that they presented with and they're still suffering and they, they don't have any answers. And so to me, that's why, back to your earlier question, if I was going to choose like where to go and learn what I want to learn, like one of the, the things ILADS teaches is to, to treat patients and follow them closely watching for improvement with consideration of extending the treatment if the patient is still not fully recovered. You know, if they're, if a patient is getting better and better, um, I keep going. You know, I don't stop it just because it's an arbitrary amount of time that they've been treated. And I'm following them. I'm checking their labs. I'm checking in with them. I give them precautions and tell them to reach out to us if, if they start having any, you know, warning symptoms that maybe we need to change the therapy. Um, and I feel like that's good medicine. Yeah, absolutely. Not just following a recommendation, one size fits all, like, oh, this is all you need to take and you're done and nothing can do for you. It's like, I think it's more important for people to have that relationship with their doctor and kind of really, really work there and guide each other. And like you said, like, if you're getting better, why, why stop? Just keep going until you finally feel like you are truly 100% again, or you are feeling better again, or that tree plateaus, right? Because that happens a lot with with Lyme, I feel like as well as like something's working really well for them. All of a sudden you're like, okay, it's not doing anything for me, but I'm still not quite there. So then you always, always have to be kind of shifting and trying new things. And it's like a Rubik's cube with Lyme, right? You fix, fix one thing, yeah. then you got to fix another and try to figure out how to get it all solved. Well, so I didn't really answer your question about which testing that <laughs> ILADS recommends, but I, I don't think we're here to like recommend one. We're here to try to figure out each patient. And sometimes like for me, I, I'm able to order um, the more expensive testing and evaluate them using that testing. And sometimes I'm just not. I mean, in real in the real world, people have budgets and they have limitations. And so kind of working with each patient, what they can afford. Um, and I have had patients, not that it's my preference, but that I've just had to treat almost empirically, but they have all the telltale symptoms of having been exposed to a chronic, you know, tick-borne infection or flea-borne infection. And um, and if and one of the ways I'm diagnosing them is by giving them a therapeutic and watching for them to respond to it. So mm -hmm. if I put someone on something, um, I'd rather have testing, of course, mm -hmm. but if they just can't at that particular time, I might even say start stashing aside a little bit of your budget so we can order these tests if you don't get better. And then I'll serve them on a therapy that makes sense from their clinical presentation and then just follow them closely. If they are responding to it, that tells me something also. Yep. Absolutely. And then so if someone is lucky enough to actually see the tick that bit them or notice a rash uh, versus some of these other patients that never saw the bite, never saw the tick and, you know, go, go for years having all sorts of strange symptoms and then all of a sudden find out it was Lyme. What does ILADS recommend if you are one of the lucky ones, not lucky that you got bit, but lucky that you saw it? <laughs> what do you recommend? Do you know, a lot of times people recommend saving the tick, sending it in for testing, um, start starting a treatment protocol right away. What is the ILADS recommendation for test, uh, tick testing and, and then also uh, acute treatment? So um, there is, here in Texas, people don't look for that. I mean, we just culturally here, we don't look for ticks or we, we might see a tick on our dog or we might find a tick on ourselves, but we don't think, oh, I'm going to get Lyme disease. I need to call my doctor. Literally people just pull the tick off and 
they throw it away or throw it down the toilet. I mean, that's what people do here. I think in some parts of the country where they're much more aware of the risk of Lyme disease, um, they will send the tick in to one of the, the labs to have the tick evaluated for certain types of pathogens. Um, I think that varies from lab to lab, whether that's a really good test or not. And I wouldn't personally want to wait until I got that information back to start treating. If the tick is, if, if the tick can be identified, which now there are um, even free websites where if you send a picture of a tick, um, it can be quickly identified. If it's, if it's an Exodes tick, I would put the patient on at least 21 days of doxycycline. And um, if, if they don't have an allergy or contraindication to taking it um, and then monitor them for symptoms. Um, if in 21 days they have zero symptoms, I would finish, that would be it. I would be done with the treatment. But if they go on to develop fevers, chills, like neurologic symptoms, or even just like an overall sense of uh, loss of well being, you know, a flu like illness. Um, I would extend the treatment until they were past it, you know, like in fully improved or um, start looking for potential co-infections. We kind of try to get away from that term co-infection um, just because it's not always co-occurring. But, you know, ticks carry other diseases, too, not not just not just Lyme disease. So having, you know, checking for tick-borne relapsing fever or checking for um, the Bicia, um, checking people for Bartonella, you know, trying to like think it through and really ask them a detailed history and doing a detailed physical exam to try to sort out what what's most likely is, is really important. And honestly, like I didn't have that skill set before I started going to ILADS meetings to even be able to think that way. So I, I don't get upset with other doctors who are like, we miss it because they just don't, honestly, they, they don't know, they don't have the training. And then once they get, um, a lot of times the doctors that start to come to our meetings and that we start to collaborate with either themselves or someone they love gets sick like this. And then they start looking into it more. They start using a logical practical approach. And then the next thing you know, they actually see it, you know, uh, but till they see it, even if you say the word Lyme disease, it's kind of a dirty word. in yeah. medical circles. What, and what, what, and why, why is that? Is there, you know, such a divide between medical professionals? Like this is obviously a chronic that's affecting millions and millions of people all over the planet. Why is there kind of just like Sometimes it feels like doctors are just kind of putting blinders on and are like, oh, it doesn't exist here with 10 days of antibiotics, you know, just kind of want to hide in a box. Is that? Well, there's actually a paper on PubMed that says that a new medical peer reviewed article is published every two minutes and it takes about 17 years for about 14 percent of what's published to be applied clinically. So just think about that for a minute, like how, first <laughs> of all, none of, us, stat. none of us can read it all, right? And so we read what we read, we learn what we learn, and then we have an overwhelming number of patients. We're, we don't have time to go really deeply explore these new concepts. And so unless you're seeking it, you're just not going to learn it. Um and it's not part of the content at most major medical meetings because it just doesn't really fit the current medical model, I think. Um, it goes a little bit back towards where the doctor was really, really trying to figure out the cause of their patient's issue. Um, and it, I have had I've heard all kinds of funny things over these last few years. I have had this conversation with a doctor whose niece was sick. Um, he's actually um, a pathologist, so he doesn't mm -hmm. see alive people, but he's trying to figure this out because it's affected someone in his family. Mm. And he's like, I, I hate it when patients think every hangnail was caused by Lyme disease. You know? <laughs> so I think um, I think that's interesting. An interesting thing, too, nowadays with the Internet it's not uncommon, especially I can say this because I'm I'm a Gen X. I'm I'm 50, almost 55. 
So uh, I had to write a paper one time of how do we serve all generations well? Uh, like the baby boomers tend, this is, these are generalizations, but baby boomers tend to want to go to the doctor, get their prescriptions, visit a little, tell them about, you know, things going on in their life and then leave. Uh, but they want an in-person appointment. Then you have us Gen Xers. We want to take a stack of our research that we've pulled off the internet and go to the doctor and have the doctor buy in and, you know, mm -hmm. validate what we're thinking. Yeah. It's very different. And then you've got the, you know, the next generation who they don't want to go to the doctor at all. They want to look online for something to take or do. And if that doesn't work, they want to do a virtual appointment. Um, and so, like, it's kind of no wonder we're all over the place with yeah. different ways. You know, the care is not the same. Mm -hmm. You know, go back 50 years, it was there was just kind of one option. Now there are so many options. And I think I just think doctors aren't that interested in spending a long time taking a deep dive into something they've never heard of or don't think exists or they've been taught, even though that's that happened a long time ago. Um, I mean, for me. I finished medical school in 1997. I hope that I have updated and updated and updated to learn new things, not just new medicines, but actually new conditions. Um, I find a lot of symptom labeling going on too. Like we've let, we've let ourselves slide into a place where the diagnosis codes are for symptoms. Like chronic fatigue syndrome, like what causes it? Or fibromyalgia, what causes that particular type of presentation? We actually have FDA approved drugs for fibromyalgia, but we don't, we even say we don't know the cause, but we don't look for it. I mean, we do, but not as a, not on a large scale. Um, and to me, that's really a big part of what's missing. It's like looking deeper and it doesn't fit with the quick visits, but um I think it's necessary for us to preserve our profession because a lot of patients are just done with the prescription, the robotic prescribing, you know, or the older ones actually in my practice, some of them are like, aren't you going to give me um, a new prescription? And I don't always prescribe something every visit. They're kind of surprised by that, but, and sometimes I give them three. So, but I'm hoping, I'm always looking, what can we stop? What do we need to discontinue? What are we done with? Um, and I'm not, I also always, when I have the chance to share, I think we do the patients a huge disservice when we say that all conventional care is bad from kind of like an alternative medicine side. And then the alternative practitioners or integrative or functional medicine or whatever you want to say, when they say that all conventional care is bad, I think both sides are, are wrong and both sides are being you know, polarizing. And really, if we just all looked at our patients and asked, what can I do to help this patient? We could kind of find more common ground and pull from both sides of, of what's out there to help people. And, and some doctors do. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, no one ever checked vitamin D in conventional practice. Now, I think a lot of more conventional physicians check people with vitamin D and will treat it, but it's just such a small piece of the pie. You know, the puzzle so much. So many, than, so many other things to test, right? To get a full picture on someone's actual health instead of just a, a few simple labs that miss so much. Yeah. And then, so you mentioned, you know, co-infections or additional infections that you can get from the tick. So I know this is where you're at. Uh, a common one is the alpha-gal allergy that comes from the Lone Star tick. How prevalent is that? And, you know, that's such a different one from Lyme disease because it makes you allergic to basically all red meat. I think if you really have it bad, it can be even like if you're meat or around the smell of meat, you can go into an anaphylactic reaction. What kind of findings and thoughts on that? And do you see patients that struggle with that and have they been able to overcome it? I definitely see a few patients with it. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say it's really prominent, but if, if you're the patient that has it, it, it it's everything because it, it's so limiting. So um, I, uh, I definitely tech, check patients for it. And once in a while, I will have a positive lab test. Um, it, it's just very interesting. Here in Texas, a lot of people eat red meat. Like it's it's a thing. Um, 
And so even some of them are like, they, they just don't even want to believe that disease exists as a patient. Um, so that's another thing that for which people have to be educated. I mean, I don't think a lot of doctors know about that particular condition either. Um, and the Lone Star Tick is really called the Lone Star Tick because it looks like it has a single star on it. It's all over the southeastern U.S. Um, and, you know, I've actually had some interesting patients um, find those ticks and even bring them. I mean, I've had someone bring one in in a baggie. Um, and it's interesting, that particular patient went on to develop the early stage symptoms of type 1 diabetes, uh, which is a completely different condition, obviously. And um, we basically treated her uh, as if she had Borrelia, even though like her testing wasn't positive. Um, and those early changes, you know, the early um, the little uh, spilling of urine, of sugar in the urine and um, some of the markers for type 1 diabetes, like all of that stopped and reversed. We also changed her diet. We, she was really stressed. We helped her kind of manage her stress. And um, she just graduated from high school recently and she's not a type 1 diabetic. And she had been, I mean, I think we just have to look, we have to mm -hmm. be looking, mm -hmm. you know? I so, feel like at a certain point, almost anyone that's with, you know, an inflammatory condition or autoimmune disease should be tested for Lyme. And even if it's negative, like you said, not just fully relying on the test, working someone that's fine with you, do a clinical diagnosis and work up and kind of really dive in to see really going on and why your body just automatically triggered on an autoimmune disease out of nowhere. It's, you know, I know in my own Lyme journey, you know, I had Lyme first, it took two years to get diagnosed by the already triggered on three autoimmune diseases. And I'm like, what's going on? Why is my, why is my body haywire? Now I know it's because I had an infection, multiple infections, you know, so, you know, I had some infections as well, but it's like our bodies don't just one day decide to attack themselves. That there's something I feel that always triggers it or is hiding there or, there or something kind of just weak in your body to trigger something on. Well, Erica, that doctor, that I was talking to who said every patient thinks that their hangnail is caused by Lyme disease. He also later said to me that, um, that even though, uh, everything is not Lyme disease, everything is not, not Lyme disease. And I was like, Oh, well, there you go. So I wish we could get to that place in medical conversations is, um, you know, my approach is usually let's talk about what the patient has and let's consider that as part of our uh, evaluation. We're not, I'm not saying that it causes everyone's autoimmune disease, but those patients at least weren't having, having it considered, let's mm -hmm. say it that mm -hmm. way. It's worth ruling out just to make sure you've explored it, you know. And you have to rule it out with history, physical, uh, thoughtful, careful discussion with the patient and test and then do testing. You can't just do a test either and just mm -hmm. say, oh, it's test not is negative. It's negative. Yep, absolutely. It's not it. So, yeah, until we have a reliable test, definitely not. So we have time for one more question. So I'd love to kind of end on a positive note. And, you know, where do you see the future of Lyme? Maybe in five and 10 years, do you see that, you know, with the work that you're doing with ILADS, are we going to have testing? Are we going to have more doctors that are aware? We're going to have better treatments or what's, what's kind of vision that you see for the future of Lyme and helping people. So the tick-borne diseases working group that the, the national government put together, they just had, they sunsetted recently, but they did write up three reports. And if anyone ever wants to do sort of a deep dive, they did a really good job. I, I read it. It's like eight chapters long. It's several pages. Um, but they did a deep dive into kind of what's going on. And my biggest takeaway from that is that the patients are going to be who drives this forward. Um, and not in an angry way, even though so many of my patients get angry about this being missed for so long. Um, more in a, a looking for doctors who care, encouraging those doctors to go get education, encouraging, the, encouraging those doctors to consider that this is a possibility. I mean, a lot of doctors are really kind, caring people and they want to help their patients. They just don't have any ideas. So I think if enough patients who are chronic suffering start saying, 
hey, doc, like, I know you don't think I have it, but could you really just try to learn a little bit more about it? And then, um, you know, and then can we visit again? Um, eventually, if enough patients say that to enough doctors, they will start seeking more education. Um, and we should be looking at our patients and trying to learn. I mean, do you know how many um, millions of dollars are spent every year? Patients doing really strange things because they feel so bad and mm -hmm. they're not getting relief from yeah. their doctors and approach. the treatments. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I want to pat pay all the patients on the shoulder for trying. Um, I know it's funny. I tell my staff um, sometimes the patients come across as like psychologically off, uh, but it's because they're frustrated. They don't feel well. They're desperate. It seems like no one's listening. Yep. It seems like no one cares. So I always am like, don't take it personally. Give them some space and room. And then if we can get them better, like they will go tell five other people and they will help five other people. And um, and it is a long hand holding process. I mean, I probably see like five to seven patients a day just because it's it takes a lot of time with each one. But I love my job. I love my job. I love um, getting to care for the people that I get to care for. And I think that um, doctors who get to do that would really find a lot of job satisfaction and just personal satisfaction in, in getting to do that. So I would encourage if any doctors are listening to this, I feel like more patients are, are going to tune in because they're interested. But if any doctors are listening, um, I would just say we can take our profession back. We can get back to the physician patient relationship. Um, it's totally possible if you just have to, you know, come to one of our meetings, learn from some of the rest of us who had to also learn it from someone else. Um, and little by little, I mean, it's just one, one clinician at a time that we help this, um, this change in this change happen in healthcare, but I really feel like a lot of it is patient driven. Mm -hmm. I agree. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all this amazing information. If people want to find about your practice and find more out about ILADS, has, what's the best way to find you online and social media? The things I do and say are not always necessarily representative of ILADS, yeah. but ILADS <laughs> has a pretty, a pretty robust website. Um, just type in ILADS on your uh on your search engine and it should pop up. And um, we do have some educational materials there. We're kind of working on even doing some more updating of that. There's always new things um, coming, you know? And then for myself personally, I'm in central Texas. I'm about an hour west of Austin. Um, you could just type in my name, Amy Offit, and, um, and find me. And I really like, I don't need more patients. I have plenty of patients, <laughs> um, but I love connecting with other clinicians who want to learn more and, you know, grow their knowledge base. And I mean, I'm always learning as well. I love getting to collaborate with with other doctors and nurse practitioners and PAs and, um, you know, anyone that's in a clinical setting that wants to help people um, like that's really what I enjoy um, about getting to be a part of ILADS is all that collaborative work and um, collegial work and then the learning experience that we get to have together. So we uh, are meeting this. Our next big meeting is in San Antonio in November, November 7th through 10th. Mm -hmm. It's going to be great. And um, I, I hope we have a good turnout yeah. and get to have some more people join us. Awesome. We're learning for sure. That's amazing. So We'll link to everything in the show notes as well. So thank you so, so much for joining today and looking forward to following along and see what developments there are in the ILADS as well. Thank you, Erica. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.